first uh, I would like to tell you about the meaning of puja. There are two aspects. Uh, one is the aspect that you have got your own deities within yourself. And these deities are to be awakened within you. Deities are the different aspects of one God. So on one side you have the deities, these the aspects of God which are all the time awakened. On the other side you have your own deities which are sometimes awakened, sometimes half awakened, sometimes sleeping, and sometimes sick. <laughs> so you have to use uh, two methods. One, to please the deities of God and to ask them to bless your deities or to ask them to awaken your day. So by doing the puja means when you offer anything that you have got to offer, anything that you offer is, uh, say, flowers. If you want to offer flower to God, you don't have to speak anything. You have to just offer that this is for you. Anybody can understand offering is uh, for that you don't have to have even a tongue. Even if a blind man is there, if he wants to give you something, he can just give you like this. And that expression is sufficient for anybody to be convinced that it's an offering. You don't have to say anything about it. So now when you offer a flower to God, even if you don't say a mantra, it is offered, all right, it's given. But whether it is accepted or not is a problem. But now, when you are a realized soul and you offer anything, it is acceptable to God, even if you don't say anything. But uh, what about you getting any reward out of it? After realization, when you offer anything to God, He accepts, because it's coming from a realized soul, so He accepts. Now, how do we get blessed by Him, by giving a flower to God? Now, if you don't say anything about it, you just offer the flower, then you might be rewarded with many flowers <laughs> automatically. In <laughs> or you may be Whatever material things you offer, you may be blessed materially. Then, in a subtler way, if you say something, uh, as you say for offering somebody, that humble way of saying that I'll be happy if you would accept this, uh, will be even subtler uh, results of that, maybe, uh, which uh, uh, would be uh, much wider, maybe much deeper. Now you do something symbolic, uh, which is very the essence, the principle of something. Like flowers are the uh, represent the principle of the mother earth. Now, so the sim symbolism uh, of all the things that we can offer to God has been meditated upon and has been found out. So they use five things called as panchamruta as we have here. Because if you have hit the principle, then you have really hit the whole, isn't it? Because spiritual well-being is a total well-being. It's not just partly that your material well-being or your physical well-being or your emotional well-being or your mental well-being. It's a total one, completely balanced into totality. Now, when you offer these other things, like uh, the uh, 
why uh, these uh, we call them akshata these uh, this, uh, uh, this term what do you call Yeah. Yeah. Termitic. Termitic. Termitic tries. See this yellow thing. When you offer this, you know the yellow color is that of the Swadeshtana chakra. And rice is very dear to all the gods. Now there's a trick in it because it's a human thing. Gods are fond of that. So they put turmeric on it. Means that we offer to you a rice which is yellow colored means you should give us blessings of our creativity. When you eat it, more creativity will flow and we'll be blessed by that creativity. It's a trick. Mm -hmm. The whole thing of puja is a trick of human saints, you see, how to trick God to give more blessings. <laughs> But whatever God likes is, has to be auspicious and holy. So ultimately it works out for the holiness of saints and their simple hearts. Now the puja cannot be done by a person who is not a realized soul. A person who preaches also has to be a realized soul. The one who does namaz has to be a realized soul. The one who prays has to be a realized soul. So all the utensils that are used are to be worshipped in a way that they are to be holy things. They are to be respected things. You cannot use anything, say the one you are using in the bathroom and use the same thing for the puja. It's absurd. Three things are very important. It's a ghatta, this one, it's a vessel. A uh, vessel that contains the kundalini, the vessel that contains the uh, primordial desire within us uh, to get to God is first to be worshipped, our desire is the ghatta, is the one made here and on top is called as a Shri Phala. Shri Phala means this also has got water in it, if you see. This coconut has, this is, this represents, the coconut represents the same thing. Now the, in the subtler form, it is the water for the liver, reverse of the word, reverse. And the coconut is the, is the water of all the ocean. The water from the ocean or sea rises through the tree trunk of the coconut and becomes the sweet water in the coconut. It's a symbolic thing. So this is the vessel called Ghatta Puja. This is the Ghatta Puja. Now I don't want to go to details today because we have to talk about Ganesha. The same is, now that is water, all right? Then we have to worship uh, uh, Ghanta and Shankha. These are two representing the sound. Actually, the Shankha represents the ether. Then we have the Deepa, this one. It's a light. It represents the light element called the Tejas. Normally also to the Goddess, they also give her a fan, which represents the air element. So this is how the all the five elements are pleased beforehand using them. So they, the the essences of these or the causal essences of these uh, five elements should be pleased at this time. And see about should be supporting. The puja. Now there are also all kinds of other things like your family uh, uh, deities you might be worshipping in your family some deities they should not be also at this time upsetting the puja or maybe the forefathers who are there all these things are to be quietened so that they should be told that this is a puja like this and you do not disturb us at this time. Means even thoughts should not come, their thoughts or their any disturbances. So everything is to be first made into peace. Now this is the one aspect I have told you in short, because it's a very long thing. If I have to speak about it, I'll have to speak at least three times, and then three hours each time. Still it may not be finished. Now we come to the 
second aspect which question i asked you what do you how do you get benefited by it so apart from this technique uh, to have the best uh, effect or the blessings or the best flow of the grace within us we say mantras the sound of mantras <coughs> the sound the sound echo into the being of god and they are re echoed on our chakras and then the chakras start opening up so the flow of the grace of god is received but only a realized soul should chant a mantra because without connection how will it reach god it is a vicious circle now one may say that mother you cannot get realization unless and until you get the grace of god and the chakras won't open uh, by a person who is not a realized soul uh, without opening the chakras you cannot get realization that's how the play of the mother comes in so and a for the same like you i would say the sahaj yogis have to break this vicious circle you have to raise the kundalini yourself once you raise the kundalini the kundalini opens the chakras a little bit yeah because you have given your vibrations to the chakras so once she knows there is a sahaj yogi standing behind the seeker she rises she knows you are her brothers and sisters and that you belong to the same family as she does she knows the land where she has to grow she so she can feel that and then she rises in her dignity that's how she breaks the vicious circle that's why in the beginning we don't tell them about the mantras because in the mantras you have to accept me as the deity in this advent of mine it is made compulsory that you have to recognize me because this is very precarious the resurrection time we can call it or the time of your last judgment first the realization has to be given without any uh, recognition but not to those who are denying or insulting me under any circumstances they cannot get realization whatever you do okay. even after realization if people start thinking against me vibrations will stop because of sanskara and the heart has to be completely in unison with me otherwise sanskara is closed now those people who are uh, simple who are uh, full of open heart you see such people understand me very well and they just put me in their hearts after realization after uh, going through the understanding of sahaj yoga through their mental activity also the intellectuals understand me and recognize me in a little circle <laughs> after the puja when they receive the blessings in a very blissful state they achieve then they realize the value of puja also afterwards now in india where the puja system has been traditionally coming and has been maintained quite a lot they understand it without any mental process but when they meet somebody an intellectual who has become a sahaj yogi you see uh they can't understand them they they don't want to listen about it the whole rigmarole of the whole movement of the brain <laughs> and some of them who try you see little westernized they try you see they develop an inferiority complex and they go to the left side but there is no need to understand it with mental uh, i mean to to all the time analyze it through your mental uh, process and then to understand everything and then become 
uh, yogis with the heart open, rather very circuitous. But what to do? They have gone that way, so they have to come that way. Because even if they come, become Sahaja yogis, they start questioning and thinking about it and worrying about it. So the false people just mesmerize them and take advantage of that mesmerism. So one should not feel bad if you have, if you feel like analyzing, you should go ahead with it. Because I cannot stop your speed. I am not going to mesmerize. In Sahaja Yoga, the freedom is to be respected. But we do not allow people to come for puja who have not achieved a certain amount of uh, understanding mentally of Sahaja Yoga from the Western people, not in India. But here there is a restriction. Because supposing in India, <coughs> uh, I do not explain to them, they don't want to know. They know that they'll get vibration. They already know about vibration. So I don't have to tell them you'll get more vibrations. If they get more vibrations, they know I am the Shakti. That's all. I don't have to explain. Yeah. Like as you can make out which is the best wine, they can make out who is the real person. They know the taste of it. Now, once in your puja, uh, I, I had about 6,000 people had touched my feet. So I said in a puja, now please don't have a people need not touch my feet. I said it. But they thought it was Dhumal who suggested, so they all, all got after his life. <laughs> they said, you only want to take all the blessings from mother's feet and you didn't want us to take it and they got out. <laughs> Another thing is, you see, I, in the West, I never used to make the Panchamruta with my feet but with my hands because here people would think that that's a dirty thing, feet is, and we should not have of the feet, you see. But actually the feet are very powerful and they can never be dirty. Like the river Ganges has vibrations. And if you have the water of Ganges, you'll see that it will never be dirty. On the contrary, whatever are inside that because it's never sort of very kept clean. Whatever dirt has gone into it, it settles down and doesn't dirty the thing at all. It's very clean water all the time vibrating. So one must understand whatever is pure, which is responsible for purity, which is the source of purity, can cleanse any impurity. So how it can be impure? But with the brain, if you think it, it's so limited. You cannot think of something which is just the embodiment of purity.